Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's a beautiful thing, and a lot of times when we read that, that's very edifying. When the first time I heard that gospel, I was very edified by that. I was like, thank goodness that they put that in the Bible. That makes me feel really good about myself. But then, as I went out into the world, and I thought about that, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And then I thought about everybody in the world who does not eat his flesh and does not drink his blood, they have no life in them. And especially our Protestant brothers and sisters, which make up a large part of our demographic as Christians, they read the same Bible that we do. And they think that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And in a way, he does. But the reality of what, why did Jesus really die? We know that the Last Supper is a continuation at the crucifixion and that Jesus died so that we could become one with him and that I have to receive Holy Communion so that the two may become one flesh and so that it might be I who allow Christ to live in me. So when Jesus came as a baby, he came on a mission to convert the world and to save the world and to make all of us other Christs. And he did that as a baby because the devil can't understand humility. And so too, our Lord wishes to sneak into the world in the humble disguise of a little white post. So humble, he allows himself to be disregarded, to be forgotten. But he does that so that you and I can receive him and you and I can become like other Christs. And so Christ can sneak into our jobs and Christ can sneak into our families and Christ can sneak into our schools. And we live in a world where so many people are depressed. So you and I have been given a great gift. The fact that you have the Catholic faith, and not just have the Catholic faith, the fact that you actually believe that that little white circle is God himself, the fulfillment of all desire. Do you understand how lucky you are? How blessed you are? There's people who die, who commit suicide, who go to drugs, who go to sex, who go to alcohol, who go to everything in the world, trying to fill the hole that's inside of their heart. And maybe that was you at one point in your life searching for happiness, searching for meaning, searching for purpose. And if you were gifted with the gift of the Catholic faith, why you? Why not them? If you had a conversion and you found Jesus, you were at mass and all of a sudden everything made sense and the world just seemed right when you realize that's Jesus Christ, that's how much he loves me. Again, conversion is a grace. And those of you who have been in the depths of sin know that it was a grace that you didn't merit. And you have to ask yourself the question, why me? Why me? You have to wrestle with that for yourself. I'm going to give you the answer, but it has to come into your own soul. Why do you know, why do you have faith in this such beautiful truth that you can go to the Blessed Sacrament at any time, no matter what your sadness, no matter what your fear, no matter what your temptation, no matter what your desolation, you can go into the chapel timid and afraid and come out like a lion that there's no problem that you and him cannot tackle. The Eucharist in you can take on anybody and anything. Why you? So I wrestled with that in my own life. Why me? And I'm going to give you the answer, and I'm going to teach you the steps that will help you to do it. God is calling you to be fearless. He commands us, do not be afraid. Fearless, that means confident in him, confident that he loves you, confident that he's there for you. Fearless apostles. Why you? Because God loves to work through intermediaries. He wants to work through the brokenhearted person at work. Fearless apostles of what? Of a God who lived 2,000 years ago? Of a Jesus who walked the earth 2,000 years ago? Or of a Jesus who's right there? God is calling you and me and all of our family members to become fearless apostles of the Most Holy Eucharist. That the same Jesus Christ that walked the earth 2,000 years ago is sitting right there, waiting. Waiting for us to listen. Waiting for us to give our lives to him. Waiting for us to surrender. But the devil's a cunning one. He's not a monster, so we don't hear about him often because people are, I don't want to scare the children. Hate to break it to you, but he doesn't scare the children. He's a whisperer. He's a liar. He's a seducer. 
And so I'm going to teach you the two basic ways that the devil has ruined our Eucharistic faith. So here's a very important theological principle. I receive grace according to my disposition. So if I'm open, so we have a water bottle right here. If I take the lid off of this water bottle, and then I have a cup that's much, the entrance is much bigger than this, and I were to pour a bucket of water, and they're side by side, the cup that has a bigger opening is going to receive more water. So I receive grace, I receive God's mercy, I receive God's power, I receive God's life, depending on how open I am. We think of the gospel passage where Jesus is being touched and people are pushing in on him. And there's a woman who just reaches out and barely touches his tassel. Everybody's touching him. She barely touches his tassel. And he says, who touched me? And St. Peter says, everybody's freaking touching you. There's hundreds of people here. No, 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 no. Power went out of me. Power went out of me. What happens at Holy Communion? Thousands of people receive him. Thousands, myself included, thousands of times. How often does power go out of him? Why? Because I'm not open. So the devil, through lies, through distractions, through poor teaching, poor catechesis, limits how much grace we receive. And I'm going to teach you one more axiom, and then we're going to discuss how we can chop this at the root. Lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. That's a Latin axiom. The law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of life. So if the devil's goal is to get you to live a certain way, I have to change what you believe, and I change what you believe by changing how you pray. If I can just attack your prayer life, I can take your faith from you. And if I take your faith from you, I can take the way you live from you. So if, I, if my end result is, my desire is to be a fearless apostle, so that when the enemy strikes, when people attack my faith, when there's a thousand unbelievers, seemingly like the whole world is against me, I will stand up and I will speak the truth with love. And I will let Jesus Christ speak through me. And his word, and not mine, is the one that has the power to convert. His actions, my will united to his will, is the power to work miracles and do healings if he wants me to. I'm here, Lord. Do what you will. So how do I get there? How do I have faith that's so confident? I got to change the way I pray. There's a, a saying that people say, that the devil's greatest activity is to get people to believe that he doesn't exist. That's a wrong saying. That's a wrong saying. It's not true. The greatest activity of the devil in modern times is to impact the way we pray. So I just discovered this like not even six months ago. There's a type of prayer that every doctor of the church said was absolutely indispensable. St. Alphonsus Seguari says, all of the saints became saints because of this type of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila says, if you don't do this type of prayer, you don't even need devils because you cast yourself into hell. St. John of the Cross says, you can't overcome ordinary temptation, let alone diabolical temptation, if you don't do this type of prayer. St. Alphonse says, God rarely answers the prayers of those who don't do this type of prayer. I just discovered this. I have a degree, I have two degrees in theology and philosophy. I didn't know what it was. I've been teaching on YouTube for years and years and years. Never heard of it. The reality is a lot of us already do this type of prayer sometimes, but we don't know the steps. So I'm going to teach you the steps and how that's going to radically transform how you receive Holy Communion. So the type of prayer that this is, so you can research it, on my YouTube channel has the best video on, <laughs> on this topic. I can't, I'm just being humble. I'm just telling you the truth. Humility is the truth. It's the best video on the topic. It's called mental prayer mental prayer. It has three steps that I've abbreviated and made shorter for you. Step number one is making an act of faith in the presence of God. You go to pray, you have to say, hey, Lord, I believe you're there before you start rattling off your prayers. Step number two is in your imagination, using your, your imaginative power, consider something about God. And this is important because your interior faculties, you only have intellect and imagination, and will. And you can't make choices, acts of the will, unless you've considered a reality in your head first. So God is present. I believe you're present. It's just saying, Lord, I believe you're present. You're holding me into existence. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're really here in the Eucharist. Step one. 
Step two, imagine the face of Jesus in some biblical scene or some truth. So when I'm before the blessed sacrament, I get on my knees and I say, I look at the tabernacle and then I close my eyes and I say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're here. I believe you're the risen Lord. You're sitting on your throne. You're the King of Kings. And I visualize him there. No matter what image I have in my mind of him, it, you might say, well, that's imagination. I, you could imagine the glory of God and you're never going to get close to it. So imagine a way. Imagine a way. And he's really there. And that does something psychologically. If you think about the power of the intellect, people drive themselves into panic attacks and anxiety attacks about things that aren't true because of what's going on in here. We should surrender the intellect to God. And then the third part, so number one, act of faith in the presence of God. Number two, consideration of the truth in our imagination. And number three, very important, conversation with Christ here and here. The voice of God, you'll know it's the voice of, how do I know I'm not just making it up? You are making it up. You are. But God speaks through that. You're giving God an avatar in which to communicate to you. And you will know it's God because of the movements of your soul. When God in your intellect says, be at peace, he calms the storm. You're imagining you're walking on water, etc. Be at peace. You know it's not just you because what's happening here is affected here. You feel that peace come into your soul. God alone can do that. God alone can do that. You know it's the devil when you have disturbance here fear, anxiety, irrational beliefs that are really impacting your heart and you can't get rid of this darkness. You rid that ordinarily for the Christian through mental prayer by inviting Christ here and letting him speak there. Now let's, let's take a look at how this would work if I go to mass in this way. So let's pretend like I have two people. We're going to call them Alejandra, because I just looked at her. I have Alejandra A and Alejandra B. Alejandra A comes into the church Sees the, just like most of us, okay? So I'm not making fun of you, this is most of us. Comes in, genuflects at the tabernacle. And, she, and Alejandra A is a believer, big time believer. But, and she does mental prayer, I know, because we've talked. Alejandra A just comes in, genuflects and says, my Lord and my God. Father Ricardo comes in, wow, his vestments are so snazzy. I love that guy. What kind of gel does he use? Wow, so cool, so handsome, everything. He's so like Christ, Mexican Christ. <laughs> in persona Christi. He goes up to the altar. He's so reverent. And, and this is a good liturgy. We can imagine bad liturgies, you know? He's so reverent. He says the words of consecration. He lifts up the host and you say, you're looking at the host, my Lord and my God. And then you go up for Holy Communion and you see the back of the person's head and they oh, that's a nice velvety scrunchie. Wow, okay. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah, the Lord. Okay, uh, body of Christ. Amen. So this is a believer going to communion who doesn't practice mental prayer. Imagine a person who practices mental prayer. You come into the church, you make a genuflection, you close your eyes, you imagine Christ the King just for a moment. You go into your pew, you imagine Jesus on his throne, and, you, and you're imagining this with your eyes closed. St. Teresa of Avila says it's best to close your eyes because your exterior faculties make it more difficult to focus on the interior faculties. So you close your eyes, you're imagining Jesus on his throne. You say, Lord, I can't wait to be one with you. And you're imagining him talking back to you. Then Father Ricardo comes in. You see that good hair. You close your eyes and say, no, that's Jesus walking in. And you imagine our Lord walking with Father Ricardo. Then he's at the altar. You imagine Jesus leaning over, saying the words of consecration. You have your eyes closed. You imagine Jesus being crucified. You see the nails through his hands. You see the nails through his feet. You see his lungs gasping. And then he expires and then you see heaven open up and you say, eternal father, I offer you this, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you're going up for, wow, wow, wow. Same person. Who's now more open? The person who's contemplated what's really happening. What's really happening is I can't trust my senses because I'm at the crucifixion. The mass is first and foremost, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So by using my imagination, I'm able to pierce the veil of what's really happening. My soul is more open. Grace is flowing into me. I'm going up for Holy Communion. My eyes are closed so I see nobody scrunchy. I'm just imagining the wedding, the wedding banquet of the Lamb and then the two become one flesh. And then I go back to my pew. I imagine the face of Christ and we talk to each other. And, and it's like a whole world opens up inside of you versus... And so now I know, I understand why St. Alphonsus said, God rarely answers those who do mental prayer because I'm coming in here with my eyes open, but really spiritually blind. I'm saying with my mouth, that's really Jesus. 
but I'm not grasping how real of a Jesus that is. It changes everything. And now I have grace flowing into my life in abundance so that when I meet that person at work or my friend has a problem or when I have to be called upon to give counsel to somebody who needs Christ more than they need me, now the grace is available because I've opened up the treasury. Conversion, favors from God, happen through two primary means. Petition, and so I'm petitioning through the crucifixion, through the sacrifice of the mass, and through grace, which is normally obtained through sacrifice by uniting my will to the will of God. And now I've got the grace. Now I've got the grace. And then when I do this same thing, if I go before the blessed sac sacrament and it's not mass time, and I get on my knees and I pray and I say, Jesus, I believe you're here. Then I close my eyes and then I visualize some aspect of his life and we have a conversation there. And there's a lot of freedom. Now I've walked with Christ. So my faith in him increases and I become fearless because what you're going to realize is the Christ who's talking to in your imagination and in your heart, a lot of times the things that he says are true and they, they, they happen and you do what he wants and you're like, wow, I did what he wanted and I had so much grace and I had so much peace about it. But that brings me to my second tip. Tip number one is what? Use your imagination to do mental prayer. Learn more about it. St. Teresa of Avila said that mental prayer is the first step of all the higher forms of prayer. Is it a little weird at first? Is it a little difficult? Yes, it is. It's a little weird using your imagination, just going with the flow. But if you call to mind the presence of God, call upon the Holy Spirit, you will see change. Second tip to become a fearless apostle, probably the most important tip I could give you. Every single day, make a Eucharistic touch. What do I mean by that? Every single day, come into contact with Jesus Christ, really and truly, substantially present, the living God in the flesh, in the flesh, at least once a day. Even if it's just for two minutes. Ideally, if you could go to Mass every day, receive Holy Communion, that's how you're going to become an apostle. Ideally, if you could go to the Blessed Sacrament, spend 15 minutes just praying before Him, that's how you're going to become an apostle. But at the very least, can you just drive by the church? You can't even go inside, genuflect towards the church, come into contact, something on a daily basis where you say, Jesus Christ, I believe you're there. I believe you're walking this earth. To become an apostle, you got to sit at his feet. To become an apostle, you have to receive him. And if you do this, because I know you're, some of you are looking at me like, that's impossible. St. Peter Julian Emmer, the patron saint of the Eucharistic adoration, said that the greatest, him, everybody's saying what the devil's biggest accomplishment is, but he says that the devil telling you that you, it's irrational to try and see Jesus every single day. If that's God, you want to have a good family life? And you're like, well, I have to have time for my family. Why is it now that you care about your family, but two seconds ago, you're too busy looking at your phone, you didn't care about your family when you were checking social media. If you want to love your family, become like God. Well, who does your family deserve to love them? A saint. There's no greater blessing on this earth than for a child to say, my dad is like a saint. My mom is a saint. There's no greater blessing for your husband or your wife than to be married to somebody who's a saint. And that only happens by union with Christ. You have the power. God has chosen you. I, I, wish, it, I wish it wasn't us. I wish you would choose somebody else. Make my life easier. But the reality is when we surrender to him there, and we begin to revolve our lives around this truth that he's a person, that he loves me with a passionate, zealous love, that he wants to help me in every facet of my life, and my life becomes easier and more fulfilling as I submit my will to really, tr truly treating him like if he was my master. Imagine 2,000 years ago, Jesus tells you, come follow me, and you're going to come up with all the excuses you're currently making in your mind why you can't physically come follow. I'll follow you from home, Jesus. Stay home then. Let the dead bury their dead. Our Lord is a Eucharistic, real, fleshy person still alive. He hides, but it's only because he wants you to become Christ. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your mercy, for your constant call to conversion. And we thank you for your mother, who somehow makes everything easier. Blessed Mother, we consecrate our Eucharistic faith to you. Help us day by day to love Jesus more and more like you did. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. I love you. If you need anything, Father Ricardo. Thank you.